So, this morning, brothers and sisters, we are looking at uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was, of course, one of the prophets to Israel um, and Judah, and he, uh, he had the unfortunate task of having to declare a lot of bad news to the people of Israel, but he also had the opportunity to declare good news, because this is, of course, the message that we have in scriptures overall is that there is ultimately good news. But this morning we are uh, having a mixture of both some of the bad news and some of the good news and we are hearing a little bit about how that applies to us in our situation. And so I would invite you to turn with me to uh, Jeremiah chapter 23 or to follow along on the overhead. Nope, not follow along on the overhead to uh, pull up. I, I didn't send you a scripture, did I, Pete? Sorry about that. Uh, 23 verses 1 to um, 1 to 8. There we go. Jeremiah 23 verses 1 to 8. That may show up on the overhead. I, we're out of practice. Don't remember how to do these things. Anyways, thank you, Pete. You're amazing. Um, so, Jeremiah 23, verses 1 to 8. And now, it, it's important. There's a couple things that we need to be aware of. First of all, we need to be aware of who the shepherds are, right? Because you see right in verse 1, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. And when we think of shepherds, we either think of the literal people who, you know, farm sheep. Can you farm sheep? Herd sheep? The people who take care of sheep, right? But we also often think of pastors. Uh, pastors are often referred to as shepherds. However, in this case, we are talking not only about religious leaders. Uh, Jeremiah is talking about religious leaders, but also he's talking about uh, the political leaders of Israel as well. He's talking about uh, the kings of Judah and Israel. He's talking about the various uh, leaders of the priestly um, sects and so on and so forth. So he's, he's speaking about shepherds as in the leaders of the people on various levels. So let us hear what they have, what Jeremiah has to say to us through God's inspiration. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. So then, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them, then they will live in their own land. The word of the Lord. Amen. So there's context here, of course, that we need to remember. Jeremiah is one of these prophets of exile, one of these prophets who is speaking about the reality that after many, many years of 
pretty much unbroken, although there are a couple of exceptions, but pretty much unbroken, bad and ungodly leadership in both Israel and Judah. There is exile that is happening, and that exile is the fault of, largely, the leadership of Israel and Judah. They have led the people into terrible practices, everything from idolatry to injustice. They have done things to cast out the people from living in the light of God's word. They have deceived and lied and led astray. And so Jeremiah says to them on behalf of the Lord, he says to them, beware and woe to you because you are guilty. You are guilty of leading the people astray. This exile is your fault. Right? And, and this harkens back, way back to the time of Moses, when Moses led the people out of Egypt, and God gave him all the commandments, and God gave him all the structures for Israelite society, and so on and so forth. Right then, when, when God was speaking to Moses and sharing through Moses with the people of Israel, God warned the people that if they didn't, stay with the covenant, if they didn't obey the covenant that was between them and God, that these things would happen to them. And sure enough, although God was consistently very, very patient with them, and God consistently tried to call them back through prophets and the occasional godly leader of the kingdom, the people, through their leaders, and through their deception that they received, and through the influences of the nations around them, the people went away from God again and again and again. And so God sends them away from their land. God sends them away and warns the people, the shepherds, that they will be punished for their sins for the evil that they have done. Now we need to put this in the broader biblical context as well, because remember last week we talked about the, the spiritual realms, the heavenly realms. We talked about how, you know, people walk around with these little, uh, in, in the spiritual realms, we imagine that people walk around with these little signs on top of them like they have on baseball games when you watch them on TV. But instead of saying their name, they have, you know, a check mark or, a, or an X through them or a question mark, right? We talked about how before Jesus came, from our perspective, everybody had a big X, right? That they were rejected because they had rejected God themselves. They were sinners, and they were lost, and they were hopeless. But then from our perspective, from our human perspective, if we could see into the heavenly realms, when Jesus comes and he lives and he dies and he rises again from the dead, then, then everybody all of a sudden is transformed from our perspective into having a question mark or having a check mark, right? We, you've either been saved or we don't know yet. And, and we won't know yet until that final day when we stand before the judgment throne. God, of course, knows what your situation is. God, of course, knows where you are headed and what you are doing and whether you are going to dig in your heels and refuse to accept God's love. God knows that. And God also knows whether you are going to, some point in your life, break down and accept God's love and reconciliation with Him. But, of course, we don't know that for anyone other than ourselves and we only know about ourselves when it happens right 
Well, this spiritual realm, the heavenly realms, we talked about how this is not only the place where God dwells, but is, it is in this context, it is talking about not only heaven where God dwells, but also the whole spiritual realm where, where, where Satan and his minions also dwell. And how we as human beings, even though we can't see the spiritual realm most of the time, we, we, we live in both places. Paul talks about how even now we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. And, and so we have a tendency to think of ourselves only in terms of the physical. We, we look around and we, we see and we touch and we taste and we hear and we smell and we think that this is all there is. But of course, that's not really how it is with people. People are weirdly and wonderfully and miraculously in both realms at once. And Paul talks further about how our battle now is with the powers and principalities of this world. That it's not really ultimately against human beings that we fight, but really ultimately we are fighting against Satan and his minions through the power of Christ working in us with his Holy Spirit. Now, I'm painting for you a really big picture. And it may sound fantastical, but it is not. It is biblical. This is the reality. The world we are a part of is so much bigger than even the bigness of this world. Right When we think about the physical universe and regardless of what you think about the structure of that universe, we know it's big really, really big, right? And, and, and that is only a portion of the world we live in because we also live in that spiritual realm. Now, of course, the deal is, is that God, among so many other gifts that he gives us, God gives us some form of free will. And how that free will works in, in conjunction with predestination and God's will, that's a mysterious interplay that nobody really has a total handle on. God is totally and ultimately free and all-powerful and all-knowing and everywhere at once. God is God. And yet, somehow, he, he constricts himself out of love for us to allow us some semblance of free will such that we can choose to do, for example, bad things. Right? We talked about how, and I used poor Stacy. Hopefully she's not not here today because I used her as an example last week. That's why, hey, Lydia? <laughs> yeah. Just tell her I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I used poor Stacy as an example about how she could punch me in the face, right? Um, which she doesn't, wouldn't do. But, right, th this is the thing. We have free will. I can choose to do that. I can choose to go up to you and say really mean and nasty things. And, and chances are really, really good. Like, almost 100% of the time, God is not going to stop me. Even though it's a bad choice. It's a terrible thing to do. I shouldn't do it. God gives us that freedom to choose. So too with the leaders of Israel. They chose pretty consistently over the course of hundreds of years to side, whether they knew it or not, with Satan and his minions. They chose to be on the side of idols and lies and deception. They chose to lead the people astray. And this is why they are going to face punishment. This is why they are going to be exiled. They are going to have those consequences. God could have forced them all along to do what he wanted them to do in terms of doing good things, but that's not how God works. 
God doesn't force us as a general rule. There are exceptions. But for the most part, he leaves us to make our choices. Now, how is that relevant to us today? Well, of course, it's relevant in terms of the battle is still against the powers and principalities, against Satan and his minions. Now, we know that the victory is won, that the ultimate victory is won, that ultimately Jesus Christ will return and he will judge the living and the dead, and Satan and all his minions will be tossed into the lake of fire, and that will be that. All things will be created new. There will be no more weeping. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more tears. These things are true. They are sure. They are promised. They are foretold and done. But it is also true that the battle continues in our day and age. And it is also true that the shepherds are still siding often with the powers and principalities. They are still siding with Satan. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker, is that often in Israel's day, those religious leaders were going on pretending to be following God, going on pretending to be obeying Yahweh, while in the back rooms we see them offering sacrifices to, to idols and to Baals. And it's, <clears throat> it's terrible because they proclaim themselves to be righteous God-fearing fo followers, and yet they are delivering messages of deception. And it's even worse because they get away with it for so long. And the people believe them for so long. And brothers and sisters... This is true for us, too. Sometimes the shepherds, like myself, don't even fully know that they are deceived. They themselves are deceived and they unwittingly pass that on. Sometimes the leaders, the shepherds, the pastors, the political leaders, they willingly and wittingly deceive. Because they are on side with, whether they know it or not, Satan and his powers. But we need to stop that. We need to humbly submit to God. And no truth, as Scripture teaches it. So let's be clear. There are some things in this world that our leaders will tell us are there are equal signs between these things and Christianity. But it's a lie. There are not equal signs between these things and Christianity. So, here are some of them. There is not an equal sign between democracy and Christianity. There's no equal sign. Democracy, as I think Winston Churchill said, I think, uh, maybe misquoting, he said, democracy is the worst form of government we have except for all the others. Right? And, and, and that's, that's sort of true. Right? But that doesn't mean that it's actually good. It just means it's less bad than the other systems. And certainly, the government that God instituted in the nation of Israel had nothing to do with democracy. There wasn't any democracy around. There's nothing inherently Christian about democracy. It's also true that 
there's, <laughs> and this should be obvious to most of us, there's no equal sign between uh, communism and Christianity. There's no equal sign between monarchy and Christianity. There's no equal sign between dictatorship and Christianity. There's no equal sign between any form of government on this earth and Christianity. Also, there is no equal sign between Canada and Christianity. There's no equal sign between the United States and Christianity or any other culture or country. Countries are not Christian. Countries are things created by people. The Bible says very clearly that our citizenship is in heaven and not here. Here, we are strangers waiting for our real home. There's no equal sign between Canada and Christianity. There's no equal sign between capitalism and Christianity. That should be obvious to anybody who is able to pay attention to the increasing gap between the poor and the rich. But, just like with democracy, there's no equal sign between any other economic system and Christianity either. That's just not the way it works. You can't say socialism equals Christianity. And you can't say capitalism equals Christianity either. It's just not true. There's no equal sign between any political party and Christianity either. And I mean that honestly. Even when the Christian Heritage Party was a thing, that was not an equal sign. The Christian Heritage Party did not equal Christianity. They tried, and, and I think they still exist. They're still trying, but they're not equal. They're a human institution. They're flawed. They're failed. They're, they're messed up just like the rest of us. Right? There's no equal sign between the conservative party and Christianity. There's no equal sign between the liberal party and Christianity. There's no equal sign between the Republican or the Democrat parties and Christianity. It just isn't there. And you see, part of the huge problem that we have with the shepherds, be they political or religious, in our world is that they keep on trying to draw equal signs between those things. If you're a Christian, you will vote conservative. If you're a Christian, you will vote Republican. If you're a Christian, you will support this, that, or the other thing. If you're a Christian, then you are all for capitalism. If you're a Christian, then you're all for democracy. And none of those things are true. Not one. And I'm not speaking as your pastor who has an opinion. I am speaking from the Bible. The Bible is very clear and Jesus is very clear. His whole life on earth, he eschewed the, the military and the political and he went for the righteousness and the holiness. And he debated the religious authorities on their structures and thoughts and ideas. And he poked at where they had sided with the powers and principalities. Now that doesn't mean that there are not good elements in many of those things. There are really good elements in democracy. Just like I think Winston Churchill said, right? There are things that are better than any other system. But there's no equal sign. 
And, and for us, that needs to be key, right? We need to be aware that when we walk into the store and we buy stuff, or when we see advertising on TV, or, or when we hear political parties ranting about this or that or the other thing, we need to be aware that this party, this shop, this brand, this way of living does not equal Christianity. And if we can be aware of that, then we can say, okay, how does this politician line up with the faith? And how does this politician not line up with the faith? And we can say that fairly and honestly and openly about every politician, about every stripe from every part of the political spectrum. So we can look at the NDP candidate and we can say, okay, where does this candidate line up with what the Bible teaches? And where does this candidate not line up with what the Bible teaches? So we can look at our capitalistic system and we can say, what are the good things about this system? And what are the things that are contrary to scripture? So we can look at the socialist part of our system and say, where does this line up with scripture and where does it not? We cease to be blinded by the shepherds and we can begin to live in more of the areas of our lives as God calls us to. See, because the good thing, the good news from this passage, the absolute most important, most significant good news in this passage is that God promises that he will bring about a righteous branch from Jesse, right? The days are coming, this is verse 5, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which you will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. And that king and that branch is Jesus and Jesus alone. He is the measuring stick by which all things and all people are ultimately to be measured. Brothers and sisters, we are so blessed because unlike the people of Israel and Judah in Jeremiah's day, who really largely only had these other shepherds who were leading them astray with the occasional voice like Jeremiah's trying to plead with them for righteousness and for a return to God's ways, unlike them, we have seen Jesus, and we know Jesus, and he knows us. We have his spirit living within us. And so, brothers and sisters, we don't have to be deceived by the shepherds of this world who are often either deceived themselves or who, or who are willingly working alongside the powers and principalities of Satan and his minions. Instead, instead, we can live under the shepherd, the good shepherd, who will tend us so that we need no longer be afraid or terrified. We can live under his righteousness and holiness and do justice in his world. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you know, O oh God, that we have thousands of years of history in which your gospel has come to us. And we are so, so grateful for that. 
And you know also, O God, that Satan and his minions have worked for all of those thousands of years to try and deceive those he could. And that he has constantly sought to weave lies into the Christian faith just as he has sought, he did seek to and successfully wove lies into the lives of the shepherds of Israel and Judah. O oh God, help us. Help us, O oh God, to not be deceived by things that would claim to be on par or equal with Christianity. Help us, O oh God, to see through those claims through the power of your Spirit and through your Scriptures. Help us, O oh God, to fight the battles against those lies. Wherever political or religious or military leaders proclaim something that is not true, wherever there are half-lies and deceptions, wherever there are people who would claim to lead us in Jesus' name and yet do not. Help us to see through those lies in your power. And, oh God, where there are leaders who have been deceived themselves, help us, oh God, to lovingly and caringly correct and guide that together we may grow in faith and in truth. Lord God, thank you most of all for your Son, Jesus. May your wisdom flow through us that we may be part of Jesus' wise, just, and righteous reign. In Jesus' name we pray, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. We'll sing as our song of response, or rather worship together uh, with our song of response, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. May that be true. May no one else ultimately lead us unless they are truly and honestly leading in Jesus' name and willing to grow in that truth as well.